Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the St. Louis Podcast for April 7th, 2023. I'm one of your glorious hosts, Garrett Atkins, the CEO of an award-winning and fastest-growing marketing agency, founder of the studio we're sitting in right now, and chairman of a holding company that owns multiple home service companies based here in St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, and then writer for the Forbes.com via the Forbes Agency Council. And I'm alongside my host and business partner across a few of those companies and the man with a beard so sexual that the oldest of old school nuns have abandoned their vows in pursuit of his approval eric brown well that's the same joke as last podcast. yeah well you said you we, went over this script we, we need to go ahead and update that one if we could yeah yeah <laughs> I, I, i'd like to challenge that beard premise I've, I've been told that about my own beard as well okay so well, two people who when are when we go into a catholic after. church both ad and myself do get surrounded by nuns so fair enough there we go <laughs> eric how are you doing today sir I'm doing great. I'm doing great. No complaints here. It's uh, Thursday. It's nice out and it's a good day to be podcasting. Yes, it is. And today we have Ed Herman, a managing partner at Brown and Crouppen on the St. Louis podcast. And we're going to get into the weeds with him and his business. But before we do, this is the St. Louis podcast where each and every Friday at 7 a.m. Central Standard Time, we drop an episode on all major podcasting, audio and video platforms such as Spotify, Apple, YouTube, major social media platforms and more where we meet with the most badass people and creators to talk about business, entrepreneurship and current events you can watch the show live or later on youtube.com backslash the st louis podcast just like katie baker and matt parker are right now now let's jump into it ed how are you doing today i am doing great it's a beautiful day out yes it is it was uh 81 i think on monday and uh i was literally sweating all day i was like this is terrible that was on Monday, though. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is right in the sweet spot. Sweater weather. Yes. Yes. And on That's the way right. here, I was Suit at... weather is great for this. 50, 60 degrees. Can't get any better. No. And we have uh, an HVAC client at our marketing firm, Vi Media, and I was just talking to them, and they were kind of concerned because they didn't get much business over the winter because there wasn't much of a winter. Yeah. And like insulation companies, HVAC companies, et cetera, like they all are highly dependent on bad weather one way or another. Yeah, we only had that one really cold week uh, yeah. right around Christmas time. One other week. than that, um, and I, I happen to be in, I think I was in Miami during that week. So I, good, I was, I, I really, I really here. lucked out. I missed that clip of cold. Yeah. And I missed the snow too. I it, think we had snow one or two times. It was the first time, I, you know, this is probably me being young, that on the sliding door to my patio uh, that time in December, there was literally ice forming on the inside of the door. And that's, I was like, this is insane. That's, yeah, that's very cold. You might want to call one of that HVAC company and yeah, right. look into your insulation. <laughs> yes. I don't think that's supposed to happen. It's not. It's no, not. <laughs> I don't think it is. That said, Eric, you want to get into a guest bio yes, for Ed here? Yes. So we got Ed Herman joining us uh, here today. Thank you, Ed, for joining us. Uh, he is the managing partner at Brown & Crouppen. Uh, servicing Missouri, Kansas, and Southern Illinois since 1979. You graduated from uh, Washington University School of Law and has spent more than a decade handling cases for injured people. Appeared on Great Day St. Louis, Show Me St. Louis, and KC Live more than 500 times. Congrats, that's awesome. Uh, offering guidance on common legal situations such as what to do when you're in an accident and a type of insurance coverage you need to protect yourself. Uh, you're also a regular presence on BCTV, where you're the creator and host of the series Ed Versus and Three Lawyers Eating Sandwiches, as well as the voice of the Bad Idea Bandit on Terry's Safety Squad. And just to let you guys know, BCTV, I assume, is Brown and Crouppen TV, it right? Is. Yes, cool. BCTV.com. You can check out all the videos. Yes, they're actually good. I've watched them before. Yes, they're great. And then uh, Ron Brown and Terry Crouppen founded Brown and Crouppen uh, with one goal, getting justice for people who have been injured, whether at work in a car accidents or from negligence. They have a team of over 250 legal professionals who have helped to build Brown and Crouppen's strong reputation for success. So now that we talked about, you know, you guys kind of being, obviously you give back a ton to St. Louis. And aren't you guys one of the largest uh, law firms in we Missouri? Are, we are the largest personal injury law firm in all of Missouri. That's what I by thought. By far. I'm glad you brought that up because I think later on we're going to talk about somebody else who's come to town who's making that claim, but it's clearly a false claim. Sure. Well, let's, I, you led right into it. Why let's don't we trash just, them why don't we just, the podcast. Uh, well, so, so we got, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question. So we got a couple people we talked about beforehand that are kind of moving into St. Louis. Uh, you know, one of those is Morgan and Morgan. 
Um, I've been seeing ads for them for the past couple of months on like all the podcasts I watch. They talk about how they have, I think, 500 plus attorneys or 1,000 plus attorneys. And yeah, they're saying that they are, what, the largest in Missouri? They're, now, they're claiming to be the largest in the universe. Uh, okay. And that may be true. And we actually have an ad that pokes fun at that and says, well, that's great if you need an attorney on Mars. Yeah. But if you need an attorney <laughs> in St. Louis, you, you might be interested in the largest in St. Louis. Yes. And that's us because, you know, our whole operation is headquartered in the state of Missouri with the vast majority of our attorneys being in St. Louis and the rest of them being in Kansas City. Morgan and Morgan, and I know John Morgan, they're have an amazing operation, uh, but it's definitely a business first and a law firm second. Um, they're all about growth and expansion. They are about volume. And uh, so, yes, nationwide, they have moved into a lot of cities, uh, somewhere between 25 and 30 cities, where they basically come in and, you know, they, they well, I don't know if this is putting the cart before the horse or not, but they generally will start advertising heavily first, mm -hmm. get a sense of what they're getting, They'll find a local law firm with one or two attorneys and say, hey, do you want to, you know, kind of be under the Morgan umbrella? And they usually get started like that. And then if it works, you know, they'll start adding more attorneys. You know, for us, obviously, it's heavy competition because they spend an enormous amount of money on television. And it's very hard for us in the course of 30 second commercials to really explain to the public why you don't want to go with. And I don't want to compare them to a Walmart, but mm -hmm. I will say, because I do think that, you know, they have a well-run business, but so does Walmart, if you think about it. One but, of the best. But yeah. the ambition that they're having is, is to go nationwide and to just keep growing and growing and growing. And the difference, of course, you get with, with us is, you know, that's not our ambition. The only thing we're looking to grow is the size of your settlement. Mm -hmm. we're, we're very client focused. We're not just focused on, well, how do we make our business bigger? You know, we're trying to make our settlements bigger because that's what helps our people out. But we don't have time in a 30 second ad to talk about the judges know the difference between an out of an out of town lawyer coming in front of them and a local lawyer coming in front of them. And if you don't think it influences how they rule on issues, of course it does. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you think it looks if you go in front of a jury and you're talking about street names that you don't even pronounce them properly because you're just not from here? You know, you know, uh, Spady Road is a great one. You're not from here. People are saying Spode Road. Yep. Uh, and there's a lot of them that we have to pair. We know when we're from St. Louis, mm -hmm. it's to pair. That's not desperate. <laughs> and and so there's all sorts of things. And then of course there's the bigger issues that people never think about, which is how does revenue work? How do you keep it in a community so it keeps spinning over and over again within a community? And if you're going to take the dollars and take them out of St. Louis and move them to Florida, which is where Morgan & Morgan is headquartered, mm -hmm. then all of the fee that they're making on those cases does not get to recirculate in the St. Louis economy. It gets to go down to Florida, and then last I checked, Florida has so much money that they don't even have state income tax. Yep. But in Missouri, the ideal situation is you wanna use somebody local so that the money that that company makes, you know, we have all local employees, they're going to take their paychecks. Where are they spending their paychecks? They're spending them at all of the businesses in St. Louis, and it keeps the money recirculating in our community, which I think is an essential commitment that everybody should have when we talk about things like the importance of buying local. So that's a message that I, I wanted to share here because there's just no way to convey that effectively in a 30-second ad. Exactly. But I think it's a really important point. Well, uh, you all but destroyed any chance of getting the sponsorship for Morgan & Morgan, so now you guys are going to have to sponsor the show after this. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Well, tell us about uh, how Brown & Crouppen got started, how you got involved. Were you there from the beginning, or did you come in later? I, I how does joined, that work? I joined 22 years ago. I'm not old enough to have been there from the beginning, but uh, they started in 1979. And the, the breakthrough and the genius behind them, and, you know, uh, Ron Brown is no longer with us. Uh, he's in a, hopefully in a in a better place. Terry Crouppen is still alive and well and, and still very active um, as our, you know, in our marketing and our, as our pitch person and in some strategic decisions as well. The guy really knows his stuff. And the biggest thing he did is he changed the entire legal landscape in St. Louis forevermore. And that's not an exaggeration because he was the first one in the market to say, you know what, maybe we should advertise our services so that the public knows what we do and they know that they can hire us without any money out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. Because before 1978, legal advertising wasn't even legal. It wasn't allowed. You couldn't advertise legal services. 
Bates versus Arizona changed all that, a Supreme Court decision that said, of course they can advertise. That's just free speech. I you had know, no idea. That's yeah, actually huge that's how deal. It is tremendous. And so imagine- How'd they here, grow before? Here he is. Well, you know, the old school thing was all about, it was kind of an old white guy's club. They mm -hmm. referred cases to each other. It was very incestuous and- Everybody, you know, rubbing, you know, uh, scratching backs and good old boys, and yeah, and doing stuff that, quite frankly, uh, you know, it wouldn't be considered ethical under today's rules. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not allowed to directly solicit any business. You can't use what they call runners. You know, uh, you know, and I think what's odd is the people that advertised on television. You know, the pioneers, the first ones to do it in each market, and I'm close friends with a lot of them. They all had that thing in common where they just immediately, it was like they saw that it was necessary, it was right, and it was just sitting there. And when Brown and Crouppen started advertising, filings went through the roof. Work comp filings especially, yep. but auto accident claims as well, which eventually became our main area. And it wasn't because we, you can't create a claim, but what you can do is you can educate people about what their rights are. And if you tell people what their rights are, and you tell people, you can have a lawyer looking at this and working on this without any money out of your pocket, of course people are going to start to assert their rights. And that was always Terry's thinking was, what is the point of having all of these rights if people don't even know that they have them and don't even know how to pursue them? Yeah. So he, it's not an exaggeration to say that he opened the doors of the courthouse for the common man in St. Louis. Before then, rich people could get justice, regular people didn't get justice. So there's nothing that we can do. We've grown the business tremendously since then, but there'll never be a, as bold of a decision as there was from that first decision. Sure. We're, we're going to go on the air and, and advertise. Nowadays, everybody advertises. Yeah. But, you know, for the first 20 years, that's when you hear the phrase ambulance chaser come up, which is an offensive phrase. I understand where people, you know, I understand the theory behind it. But yeah, the truth see of car it is, accident, pull over, I've always said to them, the I'm like, car. you know what? The people that advertise, they're doing it the clean way, above board. We know exactly how to let people know who we are and what we do. And if people need us, they know how to call us. That's not ambulance chasing. But to your point, the ones that aren't advertising, I don't know what they're chasing. Yeah. Law firms are, you know, we own a digital advertising company, and obviously we've referred business to people who specialize in traditional advertising. And one thing I've noticed um, over the years is that law firms are one of the largest presences in traditional advertising with TV, radio, billboards, the side of a bus, whatever. Why do you think that specific industry invests so much money in traditional advertising? Well, I think it all really started with, with television and radio. Um, that's where the people were, you know, the regular folk. Um, everybody watches TV, and so it's a great way to get your message out. Uh, you capture a lot of people. Now it has evolved over the years. You, a lot more that's going on on the internet, as you can imagine. But television still reigns supreme because, you know, especially in our industry, there are three industries that dominate all of local television, car dealerships, law firms, and schools. That's like the vast majority of, of local ads. And I think that, you know, for law firms, you got to go direct to consumer. There's really no other way to, to let the consumer know that you're out there and doing it. Sure. So you got to get on. If people trust you more if they have seen you, they've heard you speak, they get a sense of what you're all about. It just, the medium lends itself to it. And then what happens is the playing field always changes. And, and to be fair, until recently, when we got some serious competition in town money-wise, we always kind of controlled where the spend game happened. We were the biggest on television, so our competitors were going to have to play on our field and try to get on television. When we went over and, and started doing more on the internet, they had to do that. When we started doing heavy social media, we changed the game. Um, but now that Morgan & Morgan has come to town and they're spending so much on television and Mike DePasquale, who is, he, he is a Missouri lawyer, they're headquartered in Kansas City, but now they're offering their services in St. Louis and spending a lot of money when there's that much money going back into one particular medium, you, you got, you know, you got to fight on that. They get to choose the playing ground yeah. and mm -hmm. you got to fight yeah. them where, where they are. But I, but the easy answer to your question is you got to go where the people are. That's where the people are. Yeah. What, well, how big was uh, Brown and Crouppen right before you got involved compared to how big it is now? We're 10 times the size now in terms of revenue as, as to when I got involved 22 years ago. Um, 
it's 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 been steady growth um and uh we, you know we've gotten better and better over the years at what we do as sure. you can imagine anything you do long enough you're going to continually get better at it um but yeah we've grown exponentially and uh, since then what was the period of time since how long has it I, been? I got there in uh, the summer of 2001 so it'll be a 22 years in july okay uh, I was a handling attorney, I was handling cases for my first couple of years there, and then I got very fascinated with the business component of running the firm. And I got, I developed a very close relationship with both Ron Brown and Terry Crouppen, and you know, I just had a lot of ideas about things that we can do differently, things that we should change in our infrastructure to get better results. And uh, they gave me the authority to start implementing some of those changes. Those changes had an immediate impact. And it got to the point where they were like, we'd like you to do less casework and just do more working on, on the business instead of in the business. And from that point on, I, I really, I don't, I don't handle any cases personally anymore. I still dole out legal advice to anybody who asks, but, but and I still keep up with the law, obviously, we're required to. But uh, I mostly just focus on running the business since then. So you've 10x the business, of course, with your team in about 20 some odd years. That said, what do you think are the two or three most important things you have done over at Brown and Crouppen as an entire business that have led to that 10x and growth? Well, I think one of the most important things that you can do, there's only three ways that, that we can really grow our, our revenue. You know, we either have to get somebody to call us for the first time, or we have to get somebody to call us an additional time, uh, or we have to take each of our cases and make them more valuable. You know, that that's really it. I, I've, everything that we do, every initiative is going to fall into, growth initiative has to fall into one of those three things. So some of that is on the marketing side, lead generation, improving lead conversion. I think that was a big part of, of improving mm -hmm. our overall uh, revenue. And then, of course, really focusing on what can we do to maximize the value of each case. And then the other thing we focus on, like if I can narrow the whole company down to two key KPIs, it is average fee per case and average acquisition cost per case. So we spend most of our time trying to get the average fee per case up and the acquisition cost down because it's in between those two numbers yeah. where all of your profit is going to live. You're going to have other expenses, other overhead, yeah, but whatever overhead. profit you're going to have is going to be somewhere in that window. So if you can make that window wider, you make the profit margin wider. Sure. And what type of advertising, I mean, obviously from 2001 to about 2015, I imagine it was significantly traditional advertising. Um, and I'm sure, in fact, I know for a fact, a lot of it still is for Brown and Croup. And that yeah. said, since 2015, when most businesses were at least starting to play with digital advertising, what do you think has changed from 2015 to today in 2023 with your advertising methods that have lent to continued growth? Well, I mean, you, you have to, you have to be a major player on the internet. You know, you, you need it. Um, you know, there was a period of time where I thought search engine optimization was becoming less important because at the beginning, search optimization or search engine optimization was all about just ranking on the first page, ranking in the first couple of spots. And when everybody switched to mobile, the first page, of course, became much smaller. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't much to see. And when Google, you know, started, you know, selling their pay per click, you know, the sponsored ads would come first. Then they would have the local map pack, you know, local results yeah. would come next. So all of a sudden it, it felt like your organic rankings weren't going to really make that big of a difference. I've actually come completely around though on that. Same. And I heavily uh, value search engine optimization because it should include figuring out how to get your company ranking in the local results, those map packs, because that really is got tremendous credibility with the public and it screams convenience and it's been served up right for them. So a lot of our SEO is spent on trying to secure the top spots in the map packs. Yeah, the yep. Google business profile. Yes, and Posting huge. on there like you do on social media, basically. Yes. That said, like uh, we found, obviously we do search engine optimization for small to Fortune 500. And with that, still 80% of traffic is caught in those first three uh, organic results, which is because um, I too was worried about search engine optimization and, and kind of am now because of chat GPT because um, once you familiarize yourself with that, you'll see that it's actually a possible replacement for traditional search. 
But that said, uh, I was worried about SEO for a second there, but uh, after we look at the data, I mean, still tons of, and that's where the traffic is still. That said, some businesses need Google business profiles more than others. Yeah. Like obviously a restaurant, hardly anyone's going to an organic search result for a restaurant. They're going to Google business profile, clicking see more, scrolling through, yeah. looking at the number of re reviews, the reviews and ratings. Yeah, I was going to say, that's yep. the other thing is, is oh, those are you huge. go back to 2015, nobody was caring about reviews. Yeah. And now all of a sudden it plays such a significant role. Your Google reviews primarily, your Facebook reviews uh, secondarily, yeah. and Yelp, not for our business, but I imagine but for restaurants, restaurants yeah. yeah, it would be a bigger deal. And And of course, you can't just do the reviews for your main office too. You have to try to yep. get it so that each of your locations is getting a fair representation of the reviews that really belong in that area because you want those map results in each of those areas where you have an office. And one of the ways you're going to get them is you got to have a certain amount of reviews in that area. Yeah, actually a growth hack in SEO that I've started implementing for a few of our clients is establishing, if you don't can't have a full-blown brick and mortar office, to establish a virtual office in a locality you're trying to get business from, building a GB or a Google business profile there, and then trying to drive reviews to that Google business profile in the locality, because that's actually a shortcut as opposed to adding a location page on your website. Now, how does, okay, so it's not, you're not really adding it as a location page, because well, I know that for like on location stuff, I, I I think somebody, our developer said that you need you need a, some kind of physical address. They have to mail yes. a particular card to. You have to, to get the yeah. verification yeah. code right. there. So how do you do that virtually? Well, it's uh. You want to know the hack? You you well, get a, you get a connection with someone that has a co-working space, and a good co-working space should have essentially an office specifically set up for me to go to them and be like, hey, I got a painting company that doesn't have an address. But I want them, you know, just to pay essentially for a mailbox here, a suite, you know, 100 bucks or whatever a month. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of the time what's been happening with Google is they've been requiring video verification. So you actually have to show that you like I if I'm hiring this painting company that I'm actually going to be able to go into the office and talk to someone. So then you essentially need that company or that co-working space to already have an office essentially set up right so to it's, get it's that almost like a, like a shared office situation yeah. that has a shared receptionist a place mm -hmm. yeah. that you can a lobby and but all you're really renting is just one room at yeah it. yes and yeah. like Correct. for example we have a google business profile downtown st louis at 911 washington and that's where t-rex is i've had mm -hmm. it for years sure. there we actually used to work there every now and then before we grew significantly um and got a big hq in maryland heights uh, that said, as long as you can get a verification code sent there and when you're, they don't always do the video verification, but if they do, it's been a PETA it lately. looks up yeah. to par and you can get it verified, but you can't do like a PO box and stuff right, like right that. Now. That doesn't yeah. suffice. Yeah. I mean, worst case scenario, like, um, I mean, that's one of the reasons insurance companies do what they do. They, cause we used to own a farmer's insurance agency we bought and then sold. Um, with that at farmers, they literally want you to be what, at least five miles to 10 miles away from it's the like, closest, it's like three miles, but three yeah. miles away yeah. from the closest uh, other farmer's office. Cause they want to have Google business profiles every so often in every major city in, in the country. That way, when people are looking for an insurance agent in their locality, they get it due to being near them. Yeah. And so that's kind of one of the strategies that's really good. I mean, it, for a while there, it didn't matter so much and they kind of combated that, but now it matters a whole lot again. Yeah. And so. there's, I mean, there's a, I'm not going to say the company, but there's a, a contracting company in St. Louis and they have like five different, they'll rent like a super small, you know, say a couple hundred square feet, like in a shopping center and they'll just throw their name up there, but you can't open the door. Like yeah. it's just completely empty. Yeah, but just, they have the sign on a main road I know, and they have an it's address It's an amazing there. phenomenon yeah. if you think about it. All these Renting places a space are creating to not addresses even put anyone there. Yeah. Just, just to improve you know, search results, yep. but mathematically it makes good business sense. It does, yeah. it does. So how is it important for attorneys to engage with the public and promote legal education and awareness? And how does Three Lawyers Eating Sandwiches, which is one of your video series, yes. for example, on BCTV, help to achieve these goals? Well, you know, the, the idea behind Three Lawyers Eating Sandwiches was we recognize that most people, if you don't need a lawyer today, you know, if you don't have an immediate need, 
you don't have a ton of interest in, in learning about that stuff. But what we did find that uh, uh, in social media, we looked for the things that, p- that people were watching. And we thought, you know what, in, in, if we can't bring them here, we go with it to, to where they are. And people love food videos. Yeah. And we thought, well, you know what, M- not only do they like food videos, they like food videos of places that they could actually go to. Mm-hmm. So how many times you watch diners, drive-ins, and dives, and you look it up when you're in a city and you want to go to one of the places that was there. So our thinking was, you know what, we can use our advertising dollars, our promotion, our, our presence to bolster local businesses. And that was really the primary push. We weren't doing it to get our, ourselves cases, but we thought it would be a good platform to say, you know what, it's as good for local business. It shows that we're here. It shows that we're committed to the community and it shows our personalities sure. in a real life way for a long time. Because Terry, Andy and I, for the longest time, 15 straight years until we got shut down at the pandemic, we'd have lunch together three, four times a week. And we would invite people to join us sometimes. And they would always say, you know, watching you guys eat, you're like, uh, it's like a Seinfeld episode mm-hmm. because we know each other so well. We bust each other's chops. We have a good time. We talk about whatever topic. It's it's almost like a live podcast with no microphones, no cameras, nothing. It's just, that's how we have lunch. So the idea came of, you know, let let everybody join us for lunch. We'll show off the food, the sandwiches, the local goods, the community. We'll talk to each other about whatever topics are on our mind. We had no, it was never scripted. We never knew ahead of time what anybody was going to bring up. We kept it as organic as possible. And then, of course, to keep it entertaining, the art is always in the editing mm-hmm. so that it, all the boring crap you cut out and you just weave the rest of it together. Sure. But with that one, that was really the push. And what was interesting was we started that show before the pandemic. but Wow. During the pandemic, when restaurants were really suffering, we I don't want to sound heroic, uh, but we were saving businesses. There were restaurants that were struggling, that weren't going to make it. There were a few that opened during the pandemic and had just the worst timing in the world, Mm -hmm. but would tell us that when when our episode would air and those episodes were consistently getting over a million views between YouTube and Facebook. Oh, wow. it, these businesses were seeing tremendous spikes in their business. Even a really well-established place like Joya's, when our episode was running, a 30% increase in their business. That's insane. So, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, and that's why you know uh, it, we got recognized as social media influencers uh, because of that show. Now, what does it do for our business? I, I can't tell you that it, per se. I do know that a lot of people... Um, you know, it, it kind of makes us into local celebrities it keeps you and front people. Of mind. Yeah. yeah. And, and it keeps us like down to earth. You know, we're eating the same damn sandwiches as everybody well, else. We're not living face. in a different world. Yeah. Yeah. And then they start seeing like, you know, they can't say that about any of the other lawyers in town. I mean, yeah. if you think about it, all the other people that advertise, I won't mention their names because that's I'm not giving them any free airtime. It's bad enough I talked about Morgan. <laughs> um, but ask yourself, other than in their commercials, have you ever actually heard them talk about anything ever? Do you have any idea of who they are as a person? Any idea what their personality is? Are they relatable? Are they down to earth? Would you feel comfortable approaching them? And you can't answer that question about anybody. But if you ask that question about Terry Crouppen or even about me and Andy, I think mo- most people would say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, can, I know all about those guys. And not just social media. When, when Terry Crouppen did the Slam Stan Super Bowl ad, um, when Stan Kroenke, you know, took the Rams away. I forgot about that. That ad, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, was seen by millions and millions of people. It created an international buzz because we, I didn't even know at the time that Stan Kroenke owned Arsenal. Mm-hmm. So yep. between his owning of Arsenal and, and the teams in Colorado that he owns um, and the Los Angeles press got interested because he was coming out to Los Angeles with the yep. Rams – you can't even, I think that they at one point did calculate the dollar figure of how much free media we got from that. And it was like some crazy number, like 12 million bucks. So, you know, and, and I mean, yeah. and that was yeah. totally born out of, that wasn't like a, a gimmick. It was, Terry was so angry about what had happened because he had gone to every Rams game. We had been season ticket holders since we, you know, the PSLs first came out. He was, he was just fuming. And he wrote this thing just, just to be, uh, to purge uh, mm-hmm. his anger. And then he was like, you know what? I, there's got to be a lot of people in St. Louis feeling the same way. Maybe maybe we should put this on there. And I can Most just people give still feel that voice way. to their yeah. rage. And then all of a sudden, you know, serendipity, right? We get a call from the TV station that's hosting this, you know, airing the Super Bowl that year. 
that they still had a, a 30 second open in their local insertion pod because you get two local insertion pods in every Super Bowl. Still, they're very expensive to put on, but it was an opportunity. And all of a sudden, it was like a little light bulb went off. And we're like, you know what? That's where we should run that ad. And uh, our social media person in house was smart enough to say, do a press release a week ahead of time, release the ad online early, let it get out there and be seen. And then when it hits in the Super Bowl, you know, it'll, it'll hit differently. And man, was she right, because that thing was just gangbusters. And for the longest time, whenever people would see Terry, that was the end. That's what they all came up to him and said. They loved the Super Bowl ad. He spoke, he gave voice to their rage. And that's another thing. When did any of these other attorneys in town or the ones from out of town, what, what have they, you know, I mean, again, I don't want to bad mouth, but I mean, let's be honest. When have they ever really spoken on behalf sure. of the people of St. Louis? Mm -hmm. When have they put their ad dollars to help somebody else's business rather than just their own? You know, it's just, I feel like no knock on them. We just do it differently. That's all. Sure. sure. Yeah. Well, for, because our audiences, business owners, entrepreneurs, et cetera, for them, what do you think are, what do you think are two to three really good pieces of advice for smaller and aspiring entrepreneurs, but also smaller and aspiring law firms? Well, I would say this. Uh, first of all, don't be afraid to fail when it comes to marketing. Uh, the two best things that can happen in your marketing is a major success or a major failure. Um, and if, if it's not obvious, obviously a major success means it's going gangbusters and you, you can't fill the orders. Uh, a major failure is great though too, because then you can save that money forever more because, you know, that just doesn't work for my business. It's a total failure. It's all the stuff in the middle that gets squishy and you're yeah. really not sure if it's working or not. But don't be afraid to fail. You know, you try an ad, it works, you stick with it. People don't respond well to it or it's not working. Just yank it. You know, just move on. A post, you know, pay attention to your social media. Certain ones are getting a lot of interaction. Clearly is what the people want. Other ones aren't. Give them more of what they want. I mean, these are very, very basic marketing principles. Now, for a smaller law firm, it would be very difficult for them to play on the large playing field and try to get into the big advertising game. They're just not going to get a good return on their investment. You're smaller. You are going to have to go a little bit more grassroots, but that grassroots now could be done on a mass scale using things like social media or a hard target marketing like pay-per-click. Pay-per-click is not a very cost-effective way for lawyers to get cases, but it is cost effective if you have a limited marketing budget and you have to be guaranteed to get cases. Pay-per-click, you pay more, but at least you're going to get something very specific. Whereas the other stuff we do, you know, a lot of it's branded. A lot of what we're putting in front of the public, 99% of the public does not need us today. So a lot of what we do can't be that hard targeted, but pay-per-click can be hard targeted. And if I was a small law firm starting off, I would look into that because even though you're paying a little bit more to get those cases, at least you know you're getting cases for your ad dollars. There's someone out there that really needed to hear that. I was about to say, clip I'm it. I'm talking to you. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> clip it. Um, I, got a, I got a quick question real quick. I want to hop back to sandwiches. Sorry to interrupt you, Garrett. So did you see the post that just came out? Uh, uh, KSDK or someone released it, the top sandwiches. Game of sandwich. yeah, I saw that. And Paschetti's wound up winning the brackets. I'm not, I don't want to bad mouth, but they're not number one. No, but you know what? I, I looked at the brackets and I, I'm not sure that the brackets were set up fairly because mm -hmm. quite frankly, and this happens in sports too. You know, a couple of years ago, we were like, the Bills Chiefs game is really the Super Bowl, yeah. right? You know, yeah. that's going to be the great game to watch. In that one, when I saw the, the, the showdown between Blue City Deli and Adriana's, I thought, well, shit, that should have been the finals. Yep. Um, I mean, there are a few other places that I would put in there. And I will say that th they did a pretty good job in narrowing it down to the final eight, because I think, you, you know, for the most part, at least six or seven of those places were top notch. We've done episodes at Legrand's. Yeah. Wonderful Le Grand's sandwiches. awesome. Yeah. Um, we, I, even though it's technically burgers, but we, we made the decision early on that burgers are sandwiches because yeah. it's meat between bread. Yep. We did Max Local Eats, which Love Max. fabulous. Yep. And I mean, they're artisans. They take their work so seriously. And, and that's what draws me to places is places that are run by people who are passionate about the product before, you know, the money. Uh, Gramophone, uh, another great one in the Grove. Yep. Um, that was one of our earlier episodes. 
And uh, I'm trying to think of the, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on, on the name. Well, you said uh, Nomad. The, yeah, oh, Nomad. 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 Fabulous. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Nomad, they, they have a sandwich there called the Double Deuce, which is a hamburger topped in their homemade pastrami. Mm. Oh. Their homemade pastrami is is the real deal. It is is so, so good. So, yeah, those are the, some of the places okay. I would have liked to have seen make it to the finals. Uh, of course, Joy is classic, even though I don't want to call them a one-trick pony because they have a lot of really good sandwiches, but I think everyone knows their signature sandwich, the hot salami, is sort of yes. the, the driving yeah. force there. Yeah. And, and with good reason. It's a delightful sandwich. Have you ever been to Vivola Express in Maryland Heights? I have not, but that is on our list if we resume production. Okay. Right now, Terry's been in Florida with the winter, but... Um, if we resume, they're on our list, and we have not yet done an episode at Mom's Deli, and that's one that that's always awesome. pops up yeah. on these lists. So those would be two that we would definitely hit probably in the next round. We're right down the street from Vivola. I go there. I try and go there like at least every month. The Blues Barbecue Beef, yeah, delicious. I, I, it's I, so I've good. Got, I've got to get in there. I'm, I'm embarrassed that I have not had it yet because I, I'm on that 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 uh, on Instagram. There's a sandwich. Uh, St. Louis, you know, sandwich connoisseur page. Is there? Okay. Yeah. And uh, so I, of course, follow that page because I, I want to know where the good sandwiches yeah. are for personal reasons and professional reasons. Yeah. Another place, Bubba's Deli. Um, Never heard of Bubba's. Yeah. Bubba's, you want to go and you want to get their meatball sandwich. They do not do it like Adriana's, who has a great meatball sandwich and has always been my favorite in town, but that's like a classic Italian meatball sandwich. The one at Bubba's is not an Italian meatball sandwich. I would say it's more German than Italian. Absolutely delicious. One of the great sandwiches that you're going to get in San Where Louis. are they at? They are, I don't know what you call that part of town where you, you get off of 44, like around Jameson, and you're heading like, you know, in that uh, Chippewa area, yeah, yeah. you know, not too far away from there. Lindenwood Park, I think, might be okay. uh, yeah. close yep. to there, um, yep. or there's at least a park that's over there. Anyway, great owners, too. That's I, I love entrepreneurs. I love business owners. I did, um, you know, when I was doing Kansas City Taste and See, uh, we did over 100 episodes of Taste and See Kansas City, which I did with one of the stations out there, and got to go to just about every, every restaurant there. And that's another, both, we got a lot to be proud of in Missouri, because St. Louis has got an unbelievable food scene, and yep. Kansas, yeah. Kansas City has got an unbelievable food scene. They are so much more than just barbecue. It's fair. I'm not, I'm not even a, you know, what's so funny about barbecue in Missouri is it's, you know, you go to Texas and things like that. You're like, does this really, this is better than Kansas city barbecue, isn't it? Cause I've been to a few Kansas city barbecue places that are like, this is number one in the country. And it's like, I mean, it was fine, but it wasn't like mind blowing. Whereas I've been to a couple places in Texas and one place in Arizona. I was like, I've literally never had barbecue anywhere near this level, really? anywhere I've ever been. Well, no, I'll tell yeah. you one thing I've noticed about Texas barbecue I'm probably going to the wrong spot. You, you see though. a lot more beef yes. down there. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and you see a lot more pork here in, in, in Missouri. And, of course, St. Louis, you know, is like the only place you're going to find pork steaks, which I do not understand. Like, pork steaks are amazing. What are all these other places doing with, with these pork steaks? Why are they not preparing them the way that we are? This is It's delicious. It's like eating, like, delicious rib meat without having to deal with the ribs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 I cannot say anything. Uh, wouldn't, I can't think of anything bad to say about either St. Louis barbecue or Kansas city. St. Louis, a little sweeter. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, which I, I don't mind. Um, Kansas city, I, if I could put together like the perfect meal and barbecue, I would have to pull from a few different places. I think Oklahoma Joe's, which is technically on the Kansas side. Mm -hmm. We did an episode there. Every single thing on their menu was great like everything. You didn't have to find a signature item and say that's the thing. Arthur Bryant's, you know, is classic. I don't know if you watched this week's Ted Lasso, but uh, these his screen background on his laptop was Arthur Bryant's. Mm. And I'm like, ah, that's awesome. Because he throws a lot of love there because he's from there, Jason Sudeikis. And uh, they invented the burnt end. Yeah. I mean, that was a, otherwise a, a wasted part of the, uh, of the brisket. And they took that and Chopped it up, made it. Now it's an amazing treat. Yeah, it is. It's almost like how <laughs> buffalo wings started. Yeah, you know, you yeah. took like a disc, a discard, or like even the donut holes at Dunkin' Donuts. Um, why did no one? Why was everyone throwing away donut holes? They were throwing away. How does away? that make any Let sense? You know, that's the best part of the donut is the center. The lesson is before you throw anything away, figure out how to make money on it. Let me give mm. you a perfect example. Mm, Here's yeah. a segue for you. What is the equivalent of the buffalo wing for for a law firm? 
And that is generally cases that your firm doesn't handle. Don't throw them away. Help the person by getting them in the right yeah, hands. Yeah, the business. Because you, you refer, and then maybe those people refer back. In some instances, you might even be able to share in the fee, depending on if you continue assisting with any of the work. So there's a lot of money to be made in the things that you might right now be discarding. Yeah, think we of do donut that. holes, think of buffalo wings. Mm -hmm. You know, buffalo wings now are... I saw the Food That Built America is like my favorite TV series. And if you're out there and, and you're an entrepreneur, you want to learn business, watch the Food That Built America because watching these people start these incredible brands that we all grew up with, we take them for granted, but they actually all started with somebody, somebody with an idea. Mm -hmm. And you trace their journey and how they turn these things into things that I can't imagine a world without it. You know, and you see how business drives other business, how competition drives innovation and and what it takes. Like McDonald, I don't think McDonald's would even be in business if it hadn't been for their chief competitor rising as Burger King. Mm -hmm. Because I think McDonald's had a very simple business model and and they would have been paced very quickly. But the changes that Burger King brought in, particularly in introducing the Whopper, which was the first signature sandwich, a lot of people think the Big Mac came first. It did not. Look it up. But it was the creation of the Whopper that forced Ray Kroc and the team over at McDonald's. What is what is going to be our equivalent? How are we going to top this? And then, you know, you'll see in the 1970s when all the health reports came out about red meat and it's not healthy and everybody started turning their attention to chicken, which was great for KFC, but was deadly for the hamburger chains. Mm -hmm. And watching the development of the Burger King chicken sandwich and the McDonald chicken nugget. You know, we take nuggets for granted. The there was goo. no such thing as a, there was no such thing as a chicken nugget. Like there were nothing like that in any restaurant anywhere in the world. They invented an entire class of food that is now a staple amongst every child. Yeah. You know, I mean, t to this day, I mean, my daughter gets home from school, she still wants dino nuggets. I was about to say dino like, nuggets. Like, kid, you're turning yeah. 14. <laughs> can, it, do they have to be in the shape of a dinosaur, or could we just move over to nuggets? <laughs> She's like, no, I don't care about the shape. I just want sure. the nuggets. Well, this is a terrible segue, but uh, what are your thoughts on the current state of the legal system in the United States, and what changes would you like to see implemented in the future? Because from my perspective, and this may not what I'm about to say doesn't really pertain to injury law per se, but just uh, the legal system in general. It seems like a lot of things are really fucked up with the legal system here in America. Yeah, well, here's the thing. You know, um, I'm just going to say it. You know, money controls, you know, action. And if you think about it, you know, the legal system, if it's deteriorated, and I think in some ways it certainly has, it's because of outside forces who put a lot of money into a lot of legislation that's designed to protect their, their businesses, or at least they think it's protecting their businesses. And, and every time they do that, it's, it's hurting the individual consumer. You, you, it's very rare that a piece of legislation simultaneously helps business and the individual. So every time you hear some, some piece of law coming out and they want to say, we're trying to make our state more business friendly, we want to do this, this is better for business, you can hear what's really behind those words, which is the individual's getting screwed. We're gonna, and they try to sell you on it. Say, listen, we're going to go ahead and screw you and take away some of your rights, but it's going to make your state better for business, and that will serve you in some kind of trickle-down economics type of system. Sure. And, and, and unfortunately, it has diluted our rights, and that's, that, that's my biggest issue. I'll give you a couple of examples of things that have popped up in the last few years that have become commonplace. You know, most people don't, everybody knows what the First Amendment says, or at least they think they know what it says. Everybody thinks they know what the Second Amendment says. It's a pretty common one, right? We hear about that in the news all the time. Some people who, if you watch Law and Order, you might know what the Fourth Amendment is, you know, the search and seizure stuff. But right there in the Bill of Rights, the Seventh Amendment gives people the right to a jury trial for all matters and controversy in excess of $20. That is a constitutional Bill of Rights thing that we are all given. And yet that particular constitutional right has been attacked and diluted more than any of the other rights in the Bill of Rights. Every time you hear a state talk about, we want to put caps on damages. We want limitations on how much a jury can give. Well, that's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution says that a jury gets to decide the matter. 
not the legislature. The jury mm-hmm. decides it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so any kind of restriction that's actually messed that, up. that does it. And, and let me tell you what your doctor's office most likely did to you sometime in the last 10 years. Before they would agree to treat you, they had you sign something saying that if, if they committed malpractice, they want you to sign a, a mandatory arbitration agreement. Or, uh, you know, and what that basically is doing is they're saying, we don't want to get sued in a court for malpractice. So we want you to agree ahead of time to give up your constitutional right to a jury trial by signing this document that says that if I do commit malpractice and you want to bring a claim, it's going to be heard by an arbitrator or a party of arbitrators, uh, and it'll never be heard by a jury. Imagine that just to get treated at your doctor. They are basically making you. Is it legal wave. for you to sign that to waive that? Like uh, it, it is. It, okay. it is. It is legal. Oh, okay. these things are. Oh my God! You, these hospitals and doctors—they were thrilled when this came out. Yeah. And and the public was not adequately educated about it, and they were certainly not adequately outraged. Um, but it's a hard thing to again. It, you know, a platform like this is good to get the word out there on stuff like that. And I, I, listen, I understand everybody is out there to protect their own interest. But to me, I draw the line if they're going to say, uh, give up a, a, an entire right that you have under the Constitution in the Bill of Rights, sign it away, or you're not going to get medical treatment. I mean, do you really want to be held hostage like that, that you can't even get medical treatment, yeah. even though you pay for health insurance, you have a card, that doctor accepts mm-hmm. that card, but they won't treat you if you don't do this, you don't waive a constitutional right? Can you imagine if a place said, uh, yeah, we won't treat you unless you uh, give up the right to free speech. We won't treat you if we find out that you own a gun. I mean, we would be outraged. Everybody yeah. would be like, yeah. are you effing nuts? Nowadays, I'm not so sure. But, but you know, they'll do it with the seventh and, and everyone just sits back like it's no big deal. Yeah. Well, another question I had, I don't know if you have an opinion or, or knowledge on this, is when it comes to legis- larger pieces of legislation that are being passed, um, federally, it always seems like most of the bill isn't even the topic having to do with the topic they're talking about. Right. It's packed with mm-hmm. a bunch of yeah. international affairs stuff right. and things that, frankly, I bet a majority of Americans wouldn't even want a, the law to pass if they knew what was in there. But they don't really talk about that. No, publicly they don't. Well, that's what happens. But that's the political game. Like, how is you, that okay? Well, you know? wait, wait, but this is what happens. You know, they start off because they want to make a particular change. And in order to make that change, they have to get a certain number of votes to get that change passed. Mm-hmm. So how do you think they get those votes? They go to these people, you know, the other representatives that get a vote, and they say, we need you to vote for this bill. And that person says, well, I'll vote for the bill, but only if you add this to it. Mm-hmm. And and all of a sudden, they're adding a provision on something that they care about. But that's fundamentally it corrupt. It is. Obviously, because this person is going to, let's say I want to pass a bill. I go to Eddie and I'm like, hey, I need you to pass this bill. And you're like, OK, well, I need this put in it. And you're probably saying you need that put in it because you've talked to some other third right. party mm-hmm. and you're trying yeah. to do them a favor. Listen, so how is that even this listen this is this is how our system works. This I know. is what's broken about it because what's terrible is these bills are not even being written by the legislature. These are bills being written by industry, by lobbyists. Oh, they're uh, being written by lawyers yeah, somewhere else. Yeah, for with with their own independent interests. Yeah. And they bring in these bills and they, they bring it to a congressperson. They said, we've drafted this bill. Let me, let me tell you why we did it and what we're trying to do here. And they only give you the, the part that sounds good. Mm-hmm. And they don't explain the unintended or perhaps intended consequences. You can't give something to someone without taking something from somebody else. That's just a fact. Whether it's a right or a privilege, whatever it is, if somebody's getting something, it's coming from somebody else. Somebody's giving up something. Every one of these pieces of legislation is being written by industry. It's not being written by lawmakers. Industry, and usually with a profit motive, something that's, they want to get rid of regulations if it helps them make more money, or they want to add regulations if it helps them save money. They act like they're not for big government, but believe me, they absolutely, everybody's for big government if it serves their interest. The truth of it is, Nobody likes any government if it doesn't serve their interests, but if it does serve their interests, nobody gives a crap if it's small or big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's it. How come there isn't like some sort of disclosure law that like I, I understand probably somewhere on the internet or 
it's in, in the, te- it's in the terms and conditions. You oh, just got to read them. Yeah, it's there, but 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 <laughs> well, but, I, but they know no one's reading right. that, or even because we're watching. To. Listen, because we're watching TikTok videos, and there's no knock on that. Listen, we all work hard. Life is hard. Relationships are hard. Raising children is hard. Paying bills is hard. When we have downtime, the last thing we want to do is homework. You know, we want to do whatever activity gives us pleasure. Sail a boat, watch a TV show, go mind numbing on TikTok and go down the rabbit hole. And that's all right to do it. I don't have a problem with that. I don't think the pressure is on the individual people. I think the problem is there's simply there's no oversight and they're asking us to trust a tremendous amount. And people are generally busy and or lazy. And it's simply not their job to police the government. We Mm. were supposed to be able to elect people that we have some faith in, that we think are going to advocate for our best, you know, interests. And it's 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 a total delusion. You know, we don't pick our candidates. They're picked by the businesses. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm just curious when it's going to come to a breaking point. Because it's got, eventually people are going to get, maybe not. I mean, people, I don't think so. You know, I, you would think people eventually are going to get fed up. The one general way or the population other. is so divided right now. And- by design. By yeah. design. By design. You know, and that allows us to what? Not come together on major issues, yes. which then allows the government to more easily, I mean, government pe- and industry yeah. to more easily pass legislation and other actions. People are freaking them. out about Budweiser, Bud Light, uh, you know, TikTok ad or yeah. whatever. And, and everyone's it's throwing just, away their Budweiser. It's, it's like, it's just, there's bigger problems it's than such an a, ad. Listen, and I, I mean, <laughs> there are all sorts of important issues in this world and social issues and other stuff. But Certain things get thrust into the spotlight simply because they're they're Divisive. dividing issues, yeah. they're wedge issues. Mm-hmm. And listen, the rich people are not the majority. They have all the power because they have all the money, but they're a very small amount of people. They understood years ago, how the heck are we going to get the population to ever vote in our favor when we are such a small piece of the population and, and they're this other thing? And they said, well, if we could divide people up. Groups that should be aligned for economic reasons should be aligned. Mm -hmm. Anybody living in poverty should automatically be aligned, whether it's white impoverished agricultural uh, farmers throughout middle America or inner city impoverishment. Poverty should always vote as a group. Oh yeah. And and they'd win. But see the rich folks know that. So they say, well how do we how do we turn this into a city versus country Mm -hmm. debate? Blue versus red uh, black versus white, this kind of poverty versus that. How do we split them? And they find a couple of issues, and the issues change all the time. It, it, abortion, a hot issue for 50 years, and maybe will continue to be. Guns are a hot issue, and maybe will continue to be. Until but they'll, they'll, rec- they'll find issues. They'll have the country debating about what bathroom somebody should use if they're a trans. Who gives a crap? Yeah. You know, yeah. there are a million bathrooms that are just individual bathrooms no, anyway. The vast majority of nobody people don't cares. Care. Nobody, yeah. nobody cares. But there's we're, transgender people around before five years ago as of, well. Before they're, of course, it's not like they just started popping. They up. They weren't invented, and you and, and it's <laughs> exactly. not like people are going to yeah, make that exactly. kind of a major change to themselves <laughs> because it's the hot and trendy thing to do. And yet, some people like to paint it that way. Nobody is doing this because it's a hot trend. They're, they're coming out because when people get challenged, it's important for people to vocalize, take sides, and, and build an alliance sure. and, and build trust. But, but the reality of it is, is that that's, you look at all this nonsense going on in Florida about teaching kids about drag queens and, and gay people. And it. It, it's like it's all a distraction. It's all to keep everybody's eyes over here so that nobody is paying attention to what's going on on this other side. And on the other side are just massive exchanges of money and favors and legislation written by very, very powerful companies. Our country right now, we have two people who basically are the two most powerful people in this country, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk. The amount of information that they control, the amount of behavioral data that they have and have access to right out of the gate basically means that they can set any policy they want. They can move single-handedly the Overton window. I don't know if you're familiar with the expression, not, the Overton window. The Overton window is an expression given to whatever set of policies the public can accept at a particular point in time. Mm. And you can see on there, it shifts constantly. You look at the beginning like of the, the Overton window it, on gun control. Right, or, or like same-sex yeah. marriage. When Obama takes office, 
He's not even in favor of it, although he says he's in favor of civil unions. By the time his administration ends, he's completely in favor of it, and states have started to fall. Sure. Marijuana. When I was a kid, man, if you were, if you even talked about pot, devil's lettuce. It was yeah. This was you know this was the, this was the stuff that people did. That these were criminals. And now you know the Overton window has shifted. And now all of a sudden you go down the street and there are billboards saying, hey, we got marijuana right here. Exit two. Come come and get it. Yeah. yeah. So it's which is progress. And that means that we live in a beautiful world sometimes. But the point is, that's the Overton window is it's shifting. Mm. And when you have people that with that much influence that can control the flow of information as much as those two people can, you can literally shift that Overton window in a fraction of the time compared to what it normally would in the grand evolution of things. Speaking of Elon Musk, what are your thoughts on him acquiring Twitter? It's dangerous. You know, I, I don't know, and I, I get it. Listen, I'm, I, I'm not anti-capital. I'm all for capitalism. Jesus, I, I help run Brown or Crouppen. We, we like making money. You know, we like helping people. We love the fact that that we get to do both. But I'm not going to ignore the fact that, of, of course, everybody wants to make money. I don't know anybody out there that wouldn't rather take more money than what they have right now. So it, it's not about being against capitalism. But I am against fascism. And yeah. at a certain point, if somebody has so much power that they get to influence law, that's almost the technical definition of fascism. You know, it's, if, 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 if it's if, if, and nothing else, it's an oligarchy of a few handful of powerful people with a lot of money that are getting to set everything in this country. And the fact that they don't have the pressure of any oversight in terms of you can't vote them out, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have the option of voting out Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk. Um, unprecedented amount of power. It's hard for me to believe that there aren't, and I don't want to defame, I have no evidence of this, but, you know, there's an expression behind every great fortune, there's a crime. Um, I, I think it's a clever phrase. I think it might have been from the book of the Godfather, actually. I think it might have been uh, mm. the tag at the beginning of that book. But um, I, I, think you're I right. cannot they, they believe... They used that in the show, The Offer. You yeah. cannot amass that kind of fortune w without, you know, corners being cut, things mm -hmm. being compromised. It may be all above board, but with influence. You know, we're going to change that law. We're going to change that rule. Well, I don't think he made that acquisition to make money, frankly, because it it's power. Be he don't need money. Yeah, yeah. So, well, he has already got enough, you know. Yeah. So that said, of course, I would agree that there's definitely benefits in regards to influence. Um, but do you believe that he has good intentions on making sure there is a platform that is less influenced by third parties outside of the platform itself? Because that that's one reason I do think it's a... It is fucked up that someone can drop $44 billion by the world's leading platform in regards to influence, influential people, because it's not the most popular platform, right. but it is the platform where most of the influential people are talking to each other and the masses. A lot of people are getting their, quote, news yes. from Twitter. Mm -hmm. So that said, um, I do like to believe that uh, he does have a tendency, whether you think electric cars are good for the environment or not to focus on issues that are seemingly moving society forward in some way, shape or form. That said, do you think that's a part of his mission? Uh, you know what? I, I, I like to think the best of everybody. And you know, if you've ever read How to Win Friends and Influence People, which is yes, our leadership of course, book yeah. I, I live by, and they talk in the very first chapter about how like even villains, like they don't see themselves as villains. They all believe that the things that they're doing are somehow in the best interest of something. They're serving something with a positive intention. Um, they don't see themselves for the negative. But for me, consolidating that much power in any one individual is in and of itself far too dangerous, no matter how good their intentions are. Um, so I hope he has good intentions. I hope it turns out to be a, a, a positive uh, platform or at least something that doesn't sure. wield too much power. But the reality of it is, is you just can't have that much power consolidated in an individual. It's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. So before uh, we wrap up here, I wanted to, first of all, and it was actually brought up this morning when I was networking, you know, especially with personal injury, people are in a car accident and they're still, you know, they don't want to be that guy or that girl, right? And reach out to an attorney and figure out if they can get, you know, say more money for their injuries. So what do you have to say to those people that are maybe just 
you know, don't want to be that person because I hear that all the time. Right. Well, you know, that's because if they're saying that they have been, they have insurance. been, in, they have been influenced by the messaging mm-hmm. of large insurance companies that obviously look insurance companies. It's a very simple business money. You pay them premiums. They amass a big pile of cash. Uh, whatever they don't have to pay out in claims, they get to keep. They get to invest in the market and have it grow. So there's nothing in their business model that encourages them to pay out claims or to pay fair value on claims or to pay more than fair value on claims. Everything in their business model is designed to pay as little as possible, hold on to as much as possible. And one of the ways they do that is they convince people who are victims, legitimate victims Mm -hmm. of accidents, things that were not their fault. They're injured in a way that they were not before. They've given something away of themselves or it's been taken away from them. And, you know, they're being discouraged from being made whole. And that's all we really do. Imagine yourself at sea level. When you're in an accident and you're injured, you're taken below sea level. Your car's not working. You can't get to work. You're hurt. You can't do the things you were able to do before. You have to start treating with doctors, maybe get a surgery. Maybe you're laid up for a while. Maybe you can't take care of your household chores or lift your child. Some These things have been taken away from you. You are below sea level. Mm-hmm. The goal of the personal injury claim is to make you whole and bring you back to sea level. It is not a lottery. And, and, and proof positive of this is the fact that settlement proceeds from a personal injury claim, they're not taxable. Why aren't they taxable? Because everyone knows that you can only get taxed on something that takes you above sea level. For it to be considered income, you have to be making something above where you were before. In a personal injury claim, they acknowledge the fact that you have been put into a it's deficit. Compensating damages. Yeah, yeah. you are being yeah. made whole. There's no extra, so there's no, ta- you know, it's no taxable uh, event that has occurred there. So for those people, I would say this: if you bought a life insurance policy, or let's say your your grandfather bought a life insurance policy of a million dollars, and your grandfather died, would you have any hesitation at all? In seeking out the policy, uh, whichever insurance company wrote that policy, you know that your grandfather paid premiums all this time. You know he took out a million in life insurance. Would you hesitate for a second? Would you say, oh, Jesus, I don't want to make a a legal claim for that. You know, I don't want to be that guy. No. You'd say insurance was bought and paid for for a specific reason. The triggering event has happened. I am making my claim for that insurance money. Mm -hmm. Why would this be any different than that? Sure. Why? You know, something has been taken away from you. People bought insurance for this exact reason, and now the triggering event has occurred. Why would you not do that? And the truth of it is, if I thought that an insurance company would treat people fairly without the use of an attorney, I wouldn't encourage people to hire one. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is, how could you possibly trust the company whose job it is to either say, to I can either give you this money yep. or I get to keep this money for myself. Why on earth would you ever trust them? Yeah. So you have to hire a lawyer, even if it's not us. Listen, I'd love it to be us, but if it's not us for whatever reason, so be it. Get somebody. You can get free consultations from us, from almost any personal injury attorney in town. They'll all do free consultations. And we almost all work on a contingent basis, meaning we put our money where our mouth is. Mm -hmm. If we don't succeed in getting you a recovery, we get zero. We don't even get our expenses paid back. Can you imagine other industries if they work like that? Can you imagine what it would be like going to a doctor and finding out you only have to pay the bill if they cure your illness or take away your pain? (laughs) Now, that's the world I want to live in. Luckily, what I do for a living, I live in that world. I put my my money where my mouth is. And when we do lose a trial, and it happens from time to time, I actually take great pride in the fact that we gave the client their day in court. They're very happy. And I'm able to turn to them and say, you don't owe us a dime. You know, we've we've been working on this for three years. We've spent all of this money building up the litigation. But if we don't come through, that's our risk. That's our loss. And that gives me pride to be able to say, you don't owe us a dime. They're always shocked. They're like, seriously? Like, seriously? Like, you guys have been working hard on this for years. Like, I know that's the risk we take on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, we don't pass that risk on to you. Sure. Yeah, people. People. I mean, the reason you have insurance is so it covers you when things like that happen. I was just amazed at how many people actually don't want to be that person. And one last thing, going back to St. Louis, your new headquarters opening August. Uh, tell us about that. You know, why'd you guys decide to you know stay in the city? Well, listen. You know, we had we've been in the St. Louis city, and I mean the city 
since we opened our doors in 1979. We've moved location a couple of times. Every time there was always the temptation to move to the county. City's getting dangerous, they said. Why would you want to pay city earnings tax? That's 1% of all the wages going into the city. Move to the county. You, don't, you could pocket that money. But at the end of the day, we felt like, you know what? We are a St. Louis law firm. This is our city. I don't care if every other law firm flees to the county, and most of them have. Mm. I'm not going to mention their names, but most of our competitors look them up. They've Cowards. All, look, they've all fled to cushy places in West <laughs> County where they could be near their wealthy homes. Yeah. And they're just not where the people are. Our people are in St. Louis City. They're regular working class people. We want to be convenient for them. And you know what? Yeah, all of our employees have to pay the 1% city earnings tax. But you know what? The city needs that money. Yes, they need that money. Yeah, they do. And and if we want to have a great city, and everybody benefits from a great city. I don't care if you live in the county. You benefit from a great St. Louis city. And if you're relying on just the Cardinals and 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 the soccer team, uh, to bring in all the revenue that the city needs. Good luck, yeah. Yeah, you're nuts. <laughs> this city, it's a wonder that they don't charge. And I, I'll tell you one thing I advocate. You want controversy. I think the city should charge non-city residents for all of the attractions at Forest Park, including the zoo. It's a wonderful thing to have a just free join, zoo. Just why not join this county and city together then? Well, well the listen, county doesn't want that from no, my the, understanding. No, the, the county well, does the not. The county is losing money every ca- single year listen, right now. The, so. the county doesn't want to uh, blend uh, for, and I'm sure that there's a, a wide variety of reasons why they don't want to. I obviously believe that it makes economic sense. Um, you know, I, like I said, I am a capitalist, but I do believe that a true capitalist wants as many successful consumers out there as possible. So some people will say, well, geez, that sounds awfully liberal, as if that's a bad word. It's not a bad word. Um, But the reality of it is, if you can lift up the impoverished parts of the city, there is good land there. There are businesses that can thrive there. And if you lift up those consumers and put more money in their pocket, those consumers could then support all of the other businesses. If you're a true capitalist and and you want everything to do it, you got to you got to find those consumers at the bottom. The only way they're going to become consumers is if they can thrive. Yep. They have to thrive. And the public school system in St. Louis desperately needs the money. The security in St. Louis City desperately needs the money. The reason we chose the Hill, the Hill to us represents the best of St. Louis City. It is the neighborhood that still feels like the way it did, the you know years ago. The business owners are still, they're not some conglomerate you never get to see. You go into Adriana's, you're going to see her sitting behind the cash register when she's feeling up to it and, 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 and taking your, your order. And it's the same with every place on there. Who wouldn't want to be a part of a neighborhood like that? We didn't want to build from scratch. We wanted to bring something back. There was a warehouse on Daggett that has been boarded up since 1970. It was a 90,000 foot uh, square foot warehouse. That's where we're moving into. We took 40,000 square feet off to build a parking lot. It's going to be a 50,000 square foot, beautiful, modern, incredible office space from a building that's just been sitting there, boarded up. It's the last piece of the hill that hasn't been you know, brought to a great place. And now the hill, in my mind, will finally be complete. Well, we need more people like you in St. Louis to invest in building businesses down there because... I mean, there's so many blocks. They just have building after building. They're all offering tax incentives. I mean, they're begging people to move their businesses down there, and people still don't. Um, it's You know what? If people do not appreciate the fact that every one of us benefits by making St. Louis as a city as strong as possible, yep. uh, safe as possible, economically stable as possible, producing you know great students out of school, you know, that's the next generation that's going to be most likely living here. If you're not constantly focused on their development, then you're basically allowing a city to go downhill. Yeah. And why would you, why would you want that? Why yeah. would you want to live in a city going downhill? You want a city on the upswing. Mm-hmm. Kansas City's done a great job. Minneapolis has done a great job. There are cities around this country that have taken those areas that were once industrial and have turned them into really special places. Red Light District in KC, so, yeah. There's so many districts in Kansas City, so many neighborhoods that, that have popped up there that have been redone. Um, and uh, it's exciting to see the downtown of Kansas City 
has done incredible stuff. You know, they're building a new stadium. There's no fluke that they're getting to be one of the host cities of the World Cup mm-hmm. yeah. 2026. Yep. St. Louis is not, we have not positioned ourselves to get that type of event right now because we need more revitalization. Yeah. Well, Ed, before we wrap up today's episode, what social media profiles, business of yours, et cetera, would you like to plug for the audience? Uh, well, you know, you know, we have two Facebook pages, one dedicated to, to me as, as, quote, my fan page called uh, Ed Herman, the Godfather of Law, which is the moniker that I use on my social media. Uh, I, I post most of my stuff on Facebook, but I do have handles on Instagram and on, on TikTok. And then, of course, the Brown and Crouppen Facebook page. We post several things every day, and we don't just post it to get business. Most of the stuff we post is informing people about things going on in St. Louis or, you know, just things that people would actually be interested in. We're not trying to uh, ram the law down people's throat. Most people don't have the time to worry about that. Very busy with their lives. Yeah, sure. Well, Ed, Eric, that's all the time we have for today. However, the St. Louis podcast will be back next week at 7 a.m. Central Standard Time with a new episode. New guest, and unfortunately more of your host, Eric Brown, and myself, Garrett Atkins. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching live or later and we said something wrong, said something you hate, or said something you want to hear more about, you can visit us at stlouispodcast.com and leave us a message telling us all about it. Finally, this episode was recorded at Half Coast Studios in St. Louis, Missouri. If you're looking to start a podcast or take your current podcast to the next level, whether you're local to St. Louis or across the world, reach out to them at Half Coast Studios. Dot com. I'm sure Alex would love if we dropped his cell phone, you know, out there for everyone to oh. give him a direct call. Yeah, he would love that. <laughs> it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Ed, thanks for coming on the show and a pleasure hosting this podcast for the people of St. Louis. We'll see you again next week at Friday at 7 a.m. Central Standard Time. Thanks. Thank you.